Thank you, Sam. Okay. Well, I like having this intimate setting. Um, we will just do questions at the end, but I'm, I'm hope, hopefully this will be more like informal and um, I don't want to feel like I'm talking at you so much tonight, but more that we can just have a little bit of a conversation. So I'm sure you've heard these catch phrases, phrases flying around, which is like, the future of marketing is conversational, the future of commerce is conversational, the future of healthcare is conversational. I mean, I believe all these things to be true, but I just decided to title the talk, The Future is Conversational. Um, because it seems like a lot of things are heading in this direction. So just a little bit more about me. Um, I, the, the bot that I'm going to be talking about and the bot that I've been working on for the last couple of years is called Kit. Um, Kit is a bot that helps online store owners sort of market and manage their store. So Kit can automate Instagram marketing, Facebook marketing, can send email campaigns, does it all very simply um, through conversation. And we've been doing this for Shopify merchants for the last couple of years. Um, we launched as an SMS bot originally um, in the beginning of 2015, and then in 2016, Shopify acquired us. Um, so now we're focused really on helping Shopify merchants market and manage their store over conversation. Um, so you can think of it as sort of the Alexa of, of Shopify. So we're the assistant. We're built into every store. Every merchant has access to us um, if they want to use Kit to help them do like day-to-day -day tasks for their, for their online store. So bot technology has been around for many, many years, um, long before even I started working on this stuff. Um, so like 50 years of interesting projects in sort of scientific and research communities. Um, but Siri was sort of a big milestone, right? Siri launched in 2010, which I can't believe it was actually that long ago, but that was really the first mainstream um, intelligent assistant that kind of got everybody thinking about these things. And then about two years ago in 2016 was when Facebook Messenger launched a platform for people to build bots. And then the hype sort of went crazy. Um, it was really, I think, the hype around bots was really fueled by, by Facebook's launch of the platform. Um, I think it says the stat here is after two months of launching, they had 11,000 bots. Um, and I think that it sort of gave bots a bad name because a lot of people were building them just for the sake of building them, right? Not necessarily because they were the right solution to an actual user problem. Um, but two years later, we have lots of failures and experiences to reference of all of those. Um, and, you know, people, I think, now are getting to work on building really meaningful conversational experiences through bots. Um, and this is what I'm really excited about. So. I think even now I see headlines that say bots are dead, but they're not, <laughs> by no means. And I think that um, this is a quote by Dave Feldman, who's a great thought leader in, in bots, if you're interested in looking for somebody to follow. Um, he has a lot of great writing about chatbots. But, um, you know, whether the, the hype comes back or not, or whatever happens with that, I think that um, you should think about bots as part of your product toolkit, right? Maybe not the whole thing but as a complement to other features and other pieces of your product. Um, but the conversational aspect of it might not cover everything in your product, but it can be a really good tool for certain, certain functions. Um, so we'll just get right into it, I think. So I think that um, I sort of tried to come up with some like basic rules of engagement when you're thinking about building a bot. And since some of you are at the early stages of that, hopefully this, these will resonate. Um, so I'll just walk through these with some examples um, and then get into a little bit more about the process and then also what you can measure, what you should be measuring as you, as you launch your bot. So the first one is really keep it simple. I mean, I'd, I'd say the number one reason why bots fail is because the developers or the product people are not narrowing the bot's uh, capabilities down to one strong area of focus, right? Honestly, a bot that does one thing really well is way more valuable than one that does a lot of things not so well. Um, and so I think when we think about Kit, certainly we think about building trust with our merchants and not eroding that trust by having bad conversational experiences. So, um, you know, we call it the trust battery. It's like you, it, it starts at 100%, but it can get down to zero really, really quickly. So building that trust is key um, because you don't always get a lot of chances with users, right? You might get one, you might get two. If they have a bad experience, they're not coming back. Um, there's now over 100,000 bots on Facebook Messenger, <laughs> which is insane. Um, and I, the, the last sort of numbers as I tried to dig around that I saw were about 70% of those interactions 
were failing. So people weren't able to execute the basic task over with these bots on Messenger, right? And why is that? Um, you know, part of it is because building bots is hard. Um, and because I think because of all that hype, a lot of product managers or companies dove into to building bots without asking the basic product questions that I'm sure you would learn if you come to product management school here. But like the basic questions that you should ask, like what, prob what real problem are we actually solving? What are our users going to expect from the experience? Can we deliver on the promise? Like all those basic things. And I think for a lot of um, problems, bots aren't the right solution, right? But people were just diving into it because they wanted to get on the train. Um, so the first rule is really keep it simple. And keep it simple so your users don't end up in a conversation like this. This, this one always makes me laugh. It's the Maroon 5, the band, um, had a bot. And this is just an example. I think actually Dave Feldman um, brought up this example. But like, are you ever going to come back to this again? Like, probably not, right? And he's actually asking, like, how old is Adam? Like, two questions that you think that this thing should answer if it's the Maroon 5 bot. But this is what you want to avoid. Um, so the second rule is um, what I call respect the medium, right? So part of the reasons that conversations fail is because there's a lot of steps, perhaps. A lot of steps and a lot of required inputs from the user means a lot of chances for that conversation to go awry or to fail or for the user to drop off, right? So when you're thinking about a task that you want someone to be able to execute via a bot, like think about are you really making that easier for somebody, right? Um, my favorite example is Digit. I don't know if any of you have used Digit. It's been around for a while. It's like a savings account bought over SMS. Um, and so I absolutely love this app. I've been using it for, for years, or I've been using it just over SMS. But it's a very straightforward, task-oriented bot, and it makes this process way easier, right? It's like I can transfer money between my accounts in a couple of messages. That's a way better experience for me than like logging into my online banking and moving things around or walking into a branch. Like this is actually fun and easy and literally it makes me save money because it's so easy, right? So this to me is like a huge success. Um, so if you need to ask the user eight or 10 questions to, in order to get something done, it's probably not a good use case for a bot. Um, and so to just save yourself a lot of pain and to um, sort of have better success out of the box, I would say, like, think about how many inputs you need, and if it's more than a few, then try it a different way. Um, the third rule or sort of suggestion is to be proactive. And this is an interesting one. Um, basically, the idea is if you can control the conversation, you have a much higher chance of having that conversation be successful, right? Um, so this is kind of a silly or weird example, but it just it kept coming to mind when I was thinking about this idea of controlling the conversation. I have a mother-in-law who's super hard of hearing, and her strategy that she's learned over the years is like she controls the conversation, she initiates the conversation, then she has a better idea of what types of responses will be coming back to her, and she can understand, have a much easier time following the conversation. And you know, this is something that she's literally been taught um, over the years, and it's very true. Like, if you know what responses to expect, then you can handle that much better than just saying, I have no idea what's coming back and I'm going to have to figure out what the right response should be. So um, proactive can come in a couple of forms. Like in Kit's example, we send a lot of like suggestions and proactive messages to our users. So like making an, a suggestion about an ad campaign that they should run. So being proactive about saying, hey, this is a good idea and here's why. Do you want to do it? Yes or no. Um, the other way to do it is just making sure that you have like dynamic responses, so like auto responses, predicted responses, so that the merchant can, or the store owner in our case, can quickly move through the conversation and you, you're not expecting them to type something in, which might go awry, right? Um, so when you're designing the conversations, you really need to design very deliberately these two experiences. What, what I call the proactive experience, where the bot is initiating the conversation, and then the reactive experience, where the, the user is initiating the conversation. They're very different experiences, and you need to like, design around them very deliberately. So just an example from Kit, um, this is a conversation suggesting to the store owner to run a retargeting campaign on Facebook, right? So on the, in the left is our proactive example. So we give them some data, we tell them why we think this is a good idea, and we basically say, I've built a campaign, do you want me to show it to you, yes or no? And then they can just say yes to publish it. 
In the other scenario, of course, the same task can be executed by the merchant or the store owner writing in, hey, kid, I want to do this. But if this conversation, if you could see the whole thing, it goes on a lot longer, right? Because we have to ask, what products do you want to market? What budget do you want to use? How long do you the, want to run the campaign for? So in the proactive scenario, you can sort of pack all those inputs into one suggestion and just say, hey, how about we do this? Um, and there's a lot fewer steps. And again, it also builds trust, right? You're, you're suggesting this stuff based on data that you know about that, that store owner or that user, and you're making an intelligent suggestion that they can act on. So that's the proactive versus what I call reactive scenarios. So number four is context. Um, so a bot losing context mid-conversation, um, maybe this has happened to you, it's just like a terrible experience or a bot not having any relevant context about you to begin with, even though you've talked to this bot many, many times, also very frustrating, right? So it seems like a no-brainer that you should be using like past conversations, whatever other data you know about that, that user, in order to inform the conversation as it happens. This is like a total fail from, I don't know if you guys remember Poncho. It was a weather bot, one of the early, <laughs> early ones. Um, that was actually kind of funny, and it was very, again, very straightforward. It was like all it did was give you weather. Um, but in this case, it, doesn't, it's, it wasn't carrying the context through, right? We're still talking about Brooklyn, and it's just not understanding it. It's like this is a very simple thing to parse out, and, <laughs> you know, this is like a terrible experience. So this is, again, what you want to avoid. Um, I remember when Google Assistant came out, just in contrast to this, when Google Assistant first came out and I was testing it, I remember asking it, what's the weather like in Lake Tahoe? And it gave me the weather. And then I said, how long will it take me to drive there? Right? Which is something that Poncho obviously couldn't handle. And it said, oh, it would take you three and a half hours to drive to Lake Tahoe. And I was like, amazing. Seems so simple, but it was really amazing. And then I said, how much are flights there? And it gave me flights to Lake Tahoe. Like it, it obviously makes sense that it would remember that the thing that we're talking about through all these conversations is Lake Tahoe. So any question I'm, a I'm asking is going to be about that. Don't make the user say, you know, say the full formal question every single time. So maintaining the context within the conversation is really important. And also maintaining the overall context with that user. Like, like I said, you know what conversations you've had in the past with that user. You know like if they've bought something from your store in the Shopify example. You know, um, you know, what else? You could know like um, whether, I don't know, like just basically the context of their conversations, the content of their conversations, whether they, you know, where they live, like all these things you know in your system and you can make use of them without being overly creepy to just ha have that context so that the merchant or the, the customer doesn't have to continuously tell you every little detail about it. Um, so, so that's the example of context, like really important to do the work to, keep, to maintain context in these conversations. Number five, obsess about language. Um, this one is, is interesting. Like, you, your bot is, you know, robotic, but you want it to have a personality. And the way to maintain that consistency and maintain a tone and language that's appropriate to whoever your audience is, is to really, like, have somebody solely responsible for the voice and the tone and the language of your bot. Um, you know, this is something that you want to, like, hire a content person or a copywriter, somebody who's really going to own that because the language is what's going to make your bot sort of sticky, have a personality, make people engage with it, um, and make it feel less robotic and more of a natural conversation. So obsessing about language, I think, is really, really key. Again, I have an example from Digit um, because they have this very quirky, sort of slightly irreverent, kind of brand and tone that makes me smile. Like they've le I've learned that every time I save a certain amount of money, they're going to send me a funny gif. And I look forward to those. Um, and, you know, this is, this is just like the personality that's created that makes me really, really love this project, product. It creates this warm and fuzzy interaction between the customer and the brand. And that's kind of like the best thing you can hope for in, these, in, in building a bot product. Um, but... Let's not pretend that your bot is human, right? This is, this is something I feel really strongly about. Um, people are not easily fooled, um, and 
you know, you shouldn't sort of try to mimic a human to the point where you're, you know, you're going to let down the customer. I think that um, if you really try to mimic the human, I think your, your, your chances for success diminish. Um, and I think that it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be authentic in your voice or that you shouldn't be a little bit unpredictable or be funny or add humor or any of those things. Um, I think the key thing for me is you should have a plan for handing off the conversation to a human, right? The bot can handle it to, to some extent, to a certain level, but at some point there should maybe be a, a programmatic handoff from the bot to an actual person that gets escalated so that you know, the real human steps in and can take care of like, whatever situation that the bot is getting stuck on. So I think like, be, um, be authentic, be empathetic, be compassionate in your language of the bot, but definitely there's a line of not pretending that that bot is human. Um, the final one is something that is like, I want to talk about an exper experiment that we did with Kit that was incredibly interesting and enlightening to me as a product person. So the advice is to build in a feedback loop. Um, and there's a simple way that we did this, and I just I can't believe the results that we got. So. We basically, um, when we ask a store owner, for example, like, hey, do you want to run this marketing campaign? And they say no, Kit simply comes back and says, in many different varieties, um, may I ask you why you don't want to do that? So we decided to just test this out with one, in one small conversation. We just, Kit would start to say, hey, can I ask you why you don't want to do it? Um, and we got so much incredible product feedback. These are just three examples I pulled from today um, where they gave us like actual feedback about why they didn't want to do it. And this means a couple of things. Um, first of all, 70% of users actually responded to this, which is like insane. You would never get that response rate on any other type of product, any other method of collecting product feedback. I mean, you would just never get that much. And it's been absolutely invaluable to get this like instant feedback every time we add this to a conversation. Um, and so what we ended up doing with this, and the reason that we implemented it to begin with, was this was where we began using natural language processing and machine learning to help us with these conversations. So getting all these responses, training our models to understand what were the reasons, what were the like 10 different categories of reasons that people were saying no, and then creating conversations to respond to each type of, of response, right? So in the case of somebody says budget, typically that means they don't want to spend that much money on the ad. Then Kit turns around and says, great, why don't we do a social post instead because it's free? Like that's an example of how we would respond to budget. In the case of that dress is very low in inventory, then Kit can say, hey, should we order more inventory for that product? or um, I want a different product. So we can loop them back into the part of the conversation where they can select the products for the ad. So it's really about like parsing these responses and then pivoting the conversation so that you can still get that user to like an actual end result to complete the task. So that has been um, incredibly, incredibly useful. And you know, I continue to dig through the logs and look at this stuff every day to understand why people are saying no and what we can be doing differently in the product to help them. So a little bit about the process of building your bot. Um, so I say CX is the new UX, right? User experience is a very well-developed field. People have been doing it for years. Um, you know, in software, web, and mobile design, we have this very defined sort of field of user experience. Conversational experience is quite new, but you are starting to see roles at companies that are like conversation designers, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, so I already mentioned the importance of tone and language and obsessing about that, because I think it's a really important um, component of the success of your bot. But a couple of things that you want to think about as you're designing, you know, sort of the basics of your, your bot and your conversations, right? What is the first impression? What's the hello? How does the, the customer first interact with the bot? Especially if you're coming from an ad, which is a lot of, nowadays a lot of people are running ads where you click and it opens a thread in Messenger. Like, what is that response? Like, how can you carry over whatever they saw in the ad to what the first message is that they will see from the bot? So, like, really caring about your first impression and making sure it's tailored to wherever that user is coming into the conversation from. 
Um, does it feel like a real conversation? You know, is it, is it too robotic? Does it feel natural? Um, having varied responses to like the same situation. So in asking for feedback or why do you say no, we have like 20 different ways that we ask that question. Or if you're saying great and confirming that something was done, have 50 ways that you might say that so that it feels a little bit more natural and it does not feel robotic. Um, designing graceful endings and an exit scenario. I talked about this a little bit before. Like what is that um, sort of escalation process where you want to say, okay, this customer is... The, the bot is failing them. They're not getting through to the next step of the conversation. So what can we do to sort of gracefully exit and say, hey, I'm going to get help from somebody. We'll get back to you soon, something like that. But designing for the ending of a conversation or the exit scenario so that you can actually escalate it to a human. Um, and then finally, having like a catch-all state for fails because fails are going to happen. Um, this is another... Um, person who I really admire in talking about Bob Hillary Frazier, and she says, having a creative solution for saying, oops, we fucked up, let's try again, is one of the most powerful things a conversation designer can do. Um, I mean, how many of us have screamed at Alexa just to kind of like, because we're so frustrated that she doesn't understand, or just to sort of see what she would say if we ask, like, you know, how old are you, or something like that. Um, but I, I don't actually have Alexa, but, man, I have listened to all my friends just scream at Alexa or their kids or whatever. So having a graceful way to handle those situations, whether those people are heckling you on, on purpose um, or whether you need to just gently handle the situation where the conversation is failing, either way, um, have that creative solution. Spend some time thinking about it. Spend some time testing some different responses and, and make it work. So an example that I, I liked from a, a bot called Haven, is, you know, hey, can't say I saw that one coming. There's like 50 of these different responses that are like that, that are kind of gentle and sort of funny, and then, you know, initiating something else, like, hey, do you want me to help you with this? So thinking about this, this sort of scenario and mapping it out is key. Um, so another part of the process is just actually, like, in software, we would wireframe out the, the user experience, right? Like we would do the flows and we would start sketching out the screens. But in, in bot design, the conversation is really your wireframe, right? So the first thing that I do is I actually sit down and I write the conversation. Um, you're going to want to like diagram out the different flows so you can understand where the conversation branches. And, you know, in this case, you can see in the lower right where you have to like escalate it to a human person. Um, but as important as that, I would say, is as you're, you, there's lots of tools now that can do this. There weren't when I started working in this, but, you know, actually seeing what your conversation is going to look like to the user. I can't tell you how many times I have made major changes to my conversations just by seeing how it, how it actually plays out. Like, how long are the sentences? How long are the words? Where are the lines breaking? Um, you know, should we send this as two messages instead of one because it just feels more natural and it's better to break it up? Um, should we, uh, you know, can we just be a little more concise about how we say it? Like all these things are considerations that you want to make, but it's hard to make them unless you're actually looking at the conversation and how it would appear to the merchant or to the user. I say merchant because that's my world in Shopify, but to the user. Um, and then just obsessing again about the details. So another example from, from Kit is... Um, we wanted to like, improve the pace of the conversation to make it feel more natural, right? So we really sat down and thought about like, how fast, like we were doing tests with one another, how fast when I send you a message do you send something back to me? Of course it's based on like, how long the message is that you're writing in response. It's based on a couple of things. So we wanted to make sure the kit was sort of mimicking that just natural response time because people... Are, will expect to wait a little longer for, to get back a response that's longer or to get back you know, an ad preview or something like that. So the solution is that we literally put in fake delays into the product. Um, so even though you know, the bot, te technically we could return a response faster, um, we, we sort of built this calculation for how to do the delay so that you see that like typing bubble, but you don't get the message you know, you get the message based on essentially how long the message is times, tw times 20 milliseconds. I mean, this is very specific, but essentially we, we really sat down and came up with this formula. Um, and you should be able to see a little demo here. So you can see 
you'll see Kit's little typing bubbles and how, that they, how they vary based on whatever it is the, um, the response is going to be. And then we have those quick responses to make it easier. But, I mean, essentially we spent a lot of time on this, but it actually, when you feel the product and when you use it, it does make a huge difference. Um, so these are the kind of little details that you'll end up thinking about as you design the product and as you use it yourself. Okay, um, so the final section, what to measure, like how do you measure a conversational product? This was a challenge, um, again, because we started building Kit long before all these great analytics tools were in the market, we had to sort of figure this out on our own. Um, so, whoops, so the, the, the conversation KPIs that we sort of measure and look at and analyze and try to, to adjust um, are what is the response rate to the, to the conversation or to the message? What's the percentage of messages or that type of message that get totally ignored? So no response at all. Um, withdrawal is something we track where the, where the user like initially responds to the message but then kind of bails out of the conversation. What does that percentage look like? What does the completion percentage look like? How many of these conversations are we getting the user all the way to the end to complete the task? Um, and then what's the rejection rate? What are they getting just flat out saying no to? And we can look at these across the conversation type. We can look at this, these percentages across a particular user. And we can try to figure out how to move the needle. Um, but one of the things that we figured out pretty early is in order to measure the success of these things, we have to understand like, what constitutes the end of a conversation. And it sounds simple, but it's actually really not. So there's many things that could technically end a conversation at the point at which we can say, OK, this was an acceptance or a rejection or a withdrawal or whatever. So, you know, one is just you come to the natural end of the conversation because the task was actually completed. Great, success. One is we end the conversation because there's no response after a certain amount of time. And so then at that point we say, what was this conversation? Was it a withdrawal? Was it, you know, what, was it um, uh, a rejection? Um, another one is we end the conversation after a couple of failed attempts where the conversation's gone awry and the bot and the customer are not talking to each other successfully anymore. So we end that and we log it. Um, or there's just signals from the customer. Like they say, okay, thanks, or great, you know, some, th some signal, some verbal signal that makes us understand that that conversation's over and then we can log it into our logs under one of those categories. Um, so, you know, this is, again, all stuff that was new to us when we started this. I think there are a lot of great tools out there that will help you do this now. Um, and we'll actually do the sort of pr parsing of those conversations to figure out whether they're ended or not. But this is just something to think about as you build out each conversation. The other thing it made us do is um, think about conversations in modules. So there might be like a, a longer conversation, but we can measure each step as its own little mini conversation to understand basically like where, is, where, are, the mer where are the users falling off in that flow. Um, so then you have to think about how do we move the needle on these percentages, right? If our response rate's really low, like what can we affect to, to try to change that? Is it the language of the message? Is it the content of the message or the suggestion that's, that's included in the message? Is it context? Like are we not providing enough context? Are we not giving relevant, um, you know, including relevant sort of uh, data or context in the, in the conversation with the user? Is it the time of day? Like we track for every store owner, what is the time of day that they're most likely to respond to messages? And then we send them at that time of day. Because we know a lot of our customers are, you know, maybe they're running their store like on nights and weekends, they just don't answer stuff during the day, but we've learned that they really answer stuff between seven and nine at night in their time zone. Then that's when our bot sends them messages because we know that the response rate goes up. So, you know, you have to think about once you track all this stuff, what are you doing to actually, like, try to move the needle and make those numbers go up or down, depending on what you're tracking. So, um, just to wrap up, I mean, conversation, like, doing things conversationally is certainly a preference, right? In no way is it empirically better than a graphical user interface or a mobile app or something like that. I think that... Um, What's interesting about conversation and wh where I think it's, it's very compelling is 
um, in a lot of cases, you can reach users where they're already spending time, right? People are already spending time in Facebook Messenger. They're already spending time texting people. So if you can actually reach them there to get other stuff done, that's incredibly compelling, right? That's a, that's a great reason to decide to build a bot. Um, so I think the other piece of it is that these the conversational, a conversational interface can start to bring back a little bit of magic, especially when you're talking about a brand or a company or... Um, somebody was talking about like filing an insurance claim over conversation, right? That sounds like a much more pleasant way to do it um, than to actually like fill out a form and send it in, right? So it's about like making like I don't know, building a little bit of like that warm and fuzziness back with a brand through a conversational interface, whether it's with a human behind it or a bot behind it. I think that you know on, on the commerce side of things at Shopify, we really think about. The fact that e-commerce has completely obliterated that experience of like walking into a wine store or a watch store and having the um, you know the person that's working in the store who has a ton of domain knowledge like having a conversation with them they're making suggestions to you you're you know getting a feel for their products like that's been obliterated by e-commerce right it's a very hygienic um, like sort of just uh, I don't know just transactional experience these days. And so part of the tools that we're trying to build for, for Shopify store owners is how can you bring back a little bit of that like real in-person, real-life retail experience through, these, through the conversational interfaces that we're enabling? Because we know and we can see that those conversations are actually translating into sales, they're translating into repeat, repeat purchases by a customer, all because, again... The, the, the store owner has context about that customer and they can say, hey, I know you bought that red shirt last week. Here's some great pants that go along with it. So again, just like bringing together the human interaction plus what the bot can provide in terms of like in the background to support the, the store owner's conversation to say, hey, we know who this customer is and let's, like, let's suggest these things to them. And, and then you have actually a human experience of a little bit more recreating that in, in real life experience in a store. So um, essentially, I'm just, I, all this to say that bots are a great component of a larger strategy and you should just think about the right place where it fits, it fits in for your business um, and how it can delight customers, how it can like take out pain points in certain types of transactions and just make it a much simpler, more automated way to do things that we know people need to do. So that's it. Um, Thank you guys for being a great audience. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks to Product School.